Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Bennett. I'm a postdoc uh, with Melanie Barlow at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, Australia. And today I'd like to talk about tools for detecting, detecting repeat expansions uh, from short read sequencing. So I'll start with just a brief uh, overview of the three main areas that, that I plan to cover today. First, uh, I'll give a little background on short tandem repeats and repeat expansion disorders. Uh, second, I'll introduce four recently developed tools for detecting repeat expansions uh, from WGS data. And third, I'll show uh, some comparisons between each of these methods uh, and how they perform in simulation studies that we've performed, as well as discussing some of the relative strengths and weaknesses of each method. Uh, and finally, I guess the take home message that I hope I'll be able to, to communicate uh, is that I think these methods are very exciting and I hope you'll be encouraged to search for repeat expansions in, in your data sets. So, uh, short tandem repeats, or STRs, are repeated motifs and typically defined as being between two to six base pairs in length, sometimes one to six. And these are commonly also known as microsatellites. Uh, STRs are highly polymorphic and the number of repeats, which I also refer to as the STR size or repeat size, changes uh, rapidly due to polymerase stutter during DNA replication and depends on the particular STR loci, but the mutation rate can be uh, 10,000 times higher than the rate of de novo single nucleotide variants. There's a large number of STRs in the human genome. Uh, for example, uh, Willem et al. compiled a catalog of STR size variation using data from the Thousand Genomes Project, and they identified uh, around 300,000 STRs that are, are relatively common in, in humans. And a small number of these STR loci are associated with human disease, primarily neurological. Uh, but these are typically very large expansions rather than small changes in size due to the, the rapid mutations. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. This figure shows relative frequency of STRs uh, for different regions of the genome uh, compared to, to expectation. Uh, STRs are heavily underrepresented in coding regions, which suggests negative selection pressure. Um, and those STRs that do appear in coding regions are overwhelmingly tri or hexanucleotide repeats. And this makes sense if you think about the fact that uh, changes in the number of repeat therefore do not cause frame shifts and so are more likely to be tolerated. Uh, STRs are also underrepresented in UTRs and non-coding RNA exons, uh, but overrepresented in upstream regions uh, which contain promoters. So STRs in these regions can affect gene expression and have been suggested that the high mutation rate of STRs may allow more rapid uh, evolution. So coming back to repeat expansion disorders, there's around 30 STRs that have been associated with repeat expansions. As I mentioned earlier, these are mostly associated, mostly associated with neurological disorders. In particular, spinocerebellar ataxia is known to be associated with at least 10 uh, loci, and most of these are CAG repeats. Huntington's disease is a very well-known repeat expansion, as well as myotonic dystrophy. Uh, repeat expansions play an important role in autism. Fragile X syndrome is one of the most common genetic causes of autism. Uh, they play a role in dementia through the C9 ORF72 expansion and also a small role in epilepsy, um, for example, associated with the progressive myoclonic epilepsy of Undricht and Lundberg, as well as a very recent discovery of a novel repeat expansion plus a repeat insertion that's associated with benign adult familial myoclonic epilepsy that was just published a couple of weeks ago in Nature Genetics. So current uh, diagnostic tests for repeat expansion disorders use uh, PCR or Southern Blot based techniques. These can be expensive uh, and also time consuming because they do not inter necessarily interrogate all the uh, STRs simultaneously. So one motivation behind developing methods to search, STR, um, search for repeat expansions in WGS data is that you could be able to search all candidates simultaneously and then identify the strongest candidate before proceeding to these gold standard tests and potentially this can reduce diagnosis time and costs uh, and provide great benefit to patients. The underlying biological mechanism for uh, repeat expansion disorders are very interesting. This figure was taken from a, a really nice review paper by Tony Hannon just a couple of weeks ago in Nature Review Genetics. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this in any depth, but I can highly recommend that review if, if you're interested. But what I was hoping to illustrate in this figure is that there are different groups of repeat expansion disorders um, based on the, the genetic location of, of the repeat as well as the specific repeat motif. 
And these have different consequences at the DNA, RNA, and protein levels. Uh, for example, polyglutamine expansions, CAG expansions, typically are degenerative. However, polyalanine disorders, um, which are biochemically similar, do not appear to be do not appear to be progressive and instead seem to be mostly associated with de developmental disorders. Now, before I uh, switch to talking about the, the new bioinformatic tools for detecting repeat expansions, I wanted to briefly mention uh, a number of existing tools for genotyping STRs, which you may uh, be familiar with. For example, Lobster, Hipster, RepeatSeq, STR Viper. Uh, these tools attempt to call the exact number of repeats for each individuals. However, typically they're limited by the length of the read as they generally require the STR to be fully contained within a single read. Now, thinking about uh, repeat expansion disorders, uh, this figure here shows uh, the sizes of a number of the known repeat expansion disorders uh, and shows why this is not uh, entirely straightforward. On the x-axis here, you can see the repeat length in base pairs on a log scale for about 20 uh, known STRs. The normal range of the STR size is shown in blue, and then pathogenic expansion range in red. Uh, and in some cases, there's an intermediate range where, where the individual may be a carrier or maybe have a more milder form of the disease that's shown in the dashed green range. The two vertical black bars here show the typical read length and insert length. And so you can see that in uh, many cases, uh, especially for the, the um, expansions located in non-coding regions, the pathogenic expansion uh, threshold is much greater than uh, either the read size or even the insert size, uh, which is why um, the, the methods I just mentioned before uh, don't work for this. Uh, however, the, the new tools have been developed to address this issue and to detect these, uh, these very large expansions. Now, I'm going to attempt to give uh, a bit of a high level uh, description or an intuitive uh, picture of how these tools uh, work and the principles that they're, that they're based on. In this case, uh, we have uh, an individual, or imagine we have an individual with an expansion. This is the, the black genome at the top. And then below we have the, the reference genome shown in blue. Uh, and there's a, an STR that is indicated here in red, say something around 100 base pairs in the, in the reference, uh, but in the individual with the expansion, this is now three or four times the size. So all these methods use paired-in sequencing, and they rely on the fact that uh, you have anchor reads that, that align to the, to the reference uh, around the STR, and then you can analyze the, the STR content of the, of the mate read. So in the case of reads that, that lie to the sides of the STR on either side, you can see, um, for example, a couple of uh, fragments that, that originate with the individual and are then being sequenced, paired in sequencing, and uh, indicated at the bottom here uh, where they align on the reference genome. And you can see there's no problems with aligning reads in these sort of regions. Uh, now this uh, example read here is shown to be flanking the STR region. So you can see that, that the anchor read aligns fine. However, the read that overlaps the STR, the size or the number of uh, STR copies contained in this read is, is more than the number of STR uh, copies in the reference genome, and so you get um, some overhang or some 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 mismatch here, which is indicated in in yellow in this figure. Another um, possibility um, is is indicated by this this new read. You can see in this case that the read aligns okay to the reference. However, um, when you compare the the read as it's aligned in the reference genome to in the um, in the individual with the expansion, you get a very different uh, insert size. Uh, another possibility is you have uh, one of the reads lies entirely within, within the STR, and again, you get the same uh, issue with um, excess STR motif that, that doesn't align well uh, and would be clipped. Uh, and the final uh, possibility is if both reads lie entirely within the STR, then, then the read will probably not align to the reference at all. Now, there's uh, four different tools that have been uh, developed recently for searching for SCRs, and I'm going to give just a, a very quick overview of each of them. Expansion Hunter was developed by Igor Dalzenko and, and others at Illumina, and it identifies these anchor reads, and then either, um, depending on whether the, the reads span or 
uh, flank or uh, in repeat reads. If the reads span the STR, then it attempts to determine the exact repeat size from these reads. Uh, and that works similar to, to uh, the STR gen typing tools I, I just mentioned earlier. Uh, however, for flunking or in repeat reads, it uh, attempts to estimate the repeat size um, and determine a confidence interval um, based on these reads. Extra was developed by uh, Rick Tankard, who's a PhD student uh, in our lab, just recently graduated and, and left the lab. Extra uh, takes these anchor reads and then counts the number of base pairs in the mate that match the repeat motif. It applies permutation testing to identify outliers, um, which of course means you need a control cohort to identify outliers. Uh, and Extra also generates these uh, ECDF plots that allow you to, to nicely visualize um, the situation. So you can see example here on the right. Uh, one sample that has uh, a colored curve and dots um, has an expansion and you can see that, that in the top half of the ECDF, this curve is shifted to the right, um, corresponding to having significantly more repeated bases. And um, well, for a dominant uh, inheritance model, you, you get just one expanded allele. And so this, this, shifts, this shift starts around halfway up the ECDF. Um, for a recessive um, inheritance models, you'll see a uh, shift right from the beginning. Uh, Stretch was, is developed by Harriet Dashnow at um, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Stretch operates using a similar principle, but it implements this in a, in a very different way. Uh, stretch realigns samples to a custom reference genome that contains additional decoy chromosomes. And these decoy chromosomes um, can capture all the expanded uh, reads that containing STRs, so for all possible combinations of STRs between one and six base pairs. So if you um, refer back to the illustration I showed earlier, instead of these reads aligning poorly with um, overhang or, or clipping around the STR, these reads instead uh, get aligned to the decoy chromosome that just contains the STR repeat motif uh, for 1,000, 2,000 base pairs. And then STR analyzes reads near the STR that have mates mapped to this decoy and tests for outliers. So one major advantage of stretch is that uh, this process of realigning to and, and identifying all reads mapped to decoy chromosome uh, means that you're automatically searching for all known STRs genome-wide. However, the trade-off uh, for this is that uh, the fact that you are doing this realignment means there's a significant increase in computational expense. Uh, the final method, TreadPass, is uh, developed by the team from Human Longevity and works very similarly to Expansion Hunter. They look at spanning reads, flanking reads, uh, in-repeat uh, reads, and they also take one extra, one extra piece of information which is it considers the insert size distribution as well. TreadPass uh, uses a parameterized model, uh, and so it attempts to fit, start and do some local realignment, which uh, to me is reminiscent of, of Lobster or um, those sort of models. And one additional feature is that it, uh, it uses the estimated repeat size distribution, um, along with the known threshold and um, disease inheritance model for a particular SCR to estimate the likelihood of pathogenicity. So this table again just summarizes some of the some of the strengths and weaknesses or pros and cons for each of these methods which I've touched on already. Uh, in my opinion, Expansion Hunter is the easiest to use. Uh, TreadPass is um, fairly close as well. Uh, for known loci, uh, adding new uh, STR loci to TreadPass is a little trickier, uh, but none of these methods are particularly difficult to use at all. And so I would encourage uh, you to use them all and, uh, and then search for consensus calls among all of them. Uh, one additional point that I just want to highlight is that all methods were designed for PCR free WGS, and of course they work best uh, with that sort of data. However, there's many legacy data sets um, that have been generated using different sequencing technologies, and it's impossible or impractical at least to, to resequence these, uh, but nonetheless would be very interesting to, to interrogate. Uh, so the Tankard et al. paper demonstrated that extra works uh, with WES and PCR based WGS in addition to PCR-free WGS, and we've shown that, that all tools work fairly well, um, although there are some caveats to be aware of that I will discuss uh, in the coming slides. And one very important point uh, is when performing outlier testing, the controls must uh, have the same platform, and the ECDF on the right from Extra shows, uh, you can see there's a significantly different distribution for, for WES data as compared to WGS data for this particular loci. Okay. Now we performed a 
a simulation study to, to compare uh, these four methods. I'm going to discuss some, some qualitative results uh, and, and show results for selected loci that highlight some of the different um, strengths and limitations to be aware of and show how the different methods uh, perform relative to each other. We simulated 20 STRs with known pathogenic repeat expansions. In each case, we simulated uh, 10 uh, samples that had uh, normal uh, repeat sizes, 10 with intermediate repeat sizes, and 10 with repeat sizes uh, spread across the expanded range. And for the, the loci that, uh, sorry, for the methods that use uh, outlier testing, we also um, generated 200 controls with the STR size sampled from the observed population uh, distribution drawn from the literature. Uh, we generated FASTQ uh, data using ART um, with a 60 fold coverage aligned to the HG19, as well as using stretch to align to the, the stretch's custom reference genome. And we ran all the four repeat methods uh, and compared the results and explored how they performed as the known uh, simulated repeat size increases. Now, one uh, big uh, caveat of the study is that we simulated only the regions surrounding the STR. So effectively, this is uh, WES-like data. And so there are some drawbacks um, because these methods are not designed to, uh, not designed to, to be used WES data, although they do uh, perform reasonably well. Uh, overall, overall, the methods perform uh, very well. Uh, all, all methods perform very well and all detect the majority of expansions, um, especially once you take into account some caveats associated with the fact that we are using uh, this WES-like data. So um, I'm showing here results for um, DERPA, which is a known uh, STR, uh, a CAG expansion in the ATN1 gene. Um, now, just uh, to, to get describe what these plots are showing, um, the x-axis in all cases shows uh, log 10 of the simulated allele size and the background uh, shading color, uh, the red indicates the region that's above the, the threshold at which these expansions are known to be pathogenic. Uh, green shows the intermediate uh, expansion sizes and blue shows a normal uh, expansion range. Uh, the plot at the left compares um, the predicted uh, allele size for expansion hunter and tread pass uh, as compared to the um, known simulated allele size. And you can see for both these methods, um, there's a very close agreement um, in the normal and intermediate range. Uh, and these ranges correspond to reads that are, that are um, the reads that are greater than the size of the repeat. And so you can get uh, spanning reads and get this exact uh, determination of the repeat size. Now, as you go beyond this, um, this threshold into the pathogenic range, uh, you can see that TreadPass continues to, to have a fairly good uh, estimate of the repeat size. However, Expansion Hunter um, flattens out and you get this, this uh, apparent upper limit. And this is a, fa uh, a factor um, due to the fact that we're using uh, WES, WES or WES-like data. Um, Expansion Hunter performs much better in the whole genome sequencing data. Uh, you can use uh, coverage information and information about off-target um, regions to get to get a better estimate. Um, so it's a little bit of a an artificial um, penalty, but you can see that um, for Expansion Hunter and TreadPass, most of these um, expanded samples are at least at or slightly above the expansion threshold. The two plots on the right show uh, on the y-axis negative log 10 p-values for for extra and stretch. I just want to point out the reason they're on separate plots is if you look at the y-axis scale, there's a, a significant difference in the scale between these two methods. Uh, for extra, um, extra is based on a permutation test. So the maximum uh, p-value obtainable uh, depends on the number of permutations, which here uh, I'd perform 10 to the four permutations. Uh, whereas in stretch, the p-values become uh, extremely small. And this is uh, something that you commonly notice uh, in stretch um, in general. So it's important to be aware uh, of this fact if, if you're interpreting results or comparing results between methods, you need to, um, to somewhat calibrate for, for the range or that you might expect to see these p-values. Uh, you might notice that both uh, extra and stretch start to get p-values uh, that look significant um, before you get to the end of the normal range. And this is because both these methods use an outlier test uh, and the controls cluster at the, the low end of this normal range. And so um, extra and stretch are correctly detecting outliers before um, 
you reach the end of the the, the normal range, and then uh, in the intermediate and expanded range, they um, call all samples as outliers. So the second loci that then I'm going to show some results from is is SCAR six. Uh, this one I think is interesting. On the on the left, you can see that that expansion hunter and tread pass perform essentially perfectly. This is because SCAR six is a very small expansion, so all the reads uh, here, uh, or all the expansion uh, little sizes here are able to be to be spanned and therefore determined uh, exactly. So an, a tool like Hipster um, would also be able to, to detect this expansion in, the, in these cases. Now extra, you can see that um, the samples in the normal range are, are not significantly outliers. Uh, in the intermediate range, you can see maybe 50% uh, of the simulations uh, appear to be um, called outliers statistically. The others are more marginal. And then when you get into the expanded range, all of the expanded samples appear to be uh, significant outliers. Our stretch uh, shows some interesting behavior. Um, it doesn't start to call the expansion until you get to around halfway through the expanded uh, allele range. And this is because uh, SCAR-6 is a very small expansion and stretch doesn't pick up small expansions. The aligner tends to map uh, small, uh, tends to prefer to call uh, an insertion uh, rather than remapping the reads to these um, decoy chromosomes for these small expansions. Uh, however, once the expansion exceeds a certain size, then the reads get mapped to the decoy and stretch um, um, calls all these ones beautifully, as you can see. So this, uh, I include this because I just want to point out one of the reasons why um, it's valuable to use multiple methods because some of the methods perform better or, or worse in different regimes. Uh, the final um, loci I'm going to show some results for uh, is SCAR-12. Uh, you can see here again uh, on the left that expansion hunter and tread pass both um, perform fairly well uh, throughout the normal range, and then you get a similar effect with the expansion hunter as you get to the size of the uh, the read size that you get this artificial penalty that's introduced by the fact that we're using Wes or Wes-like data. I just want to point out the expansion hunter does perform very well in in WGS data, um, and again, uh, extra and stretch uh, perform nicely. You can see that. Uh, Again, they call outliers samples that are outliers, even if those samples are uh, still within the normal threshold range. Uh, and that's because extra and stretch use this outlier test. They don't have, or they don't attempt to um, compare uh, size estimates to, to the thresholds like expansion hunter or tread pass. Uh, whereas ex the expansion hunter and tread pass can use uh, information that is known for STRs um, where thresholds are known. So, um, just to finish by summarizing, um, repeat expansions can be identified in short read sequencing data. There's four recently developed and published methods that, that uh, can, can detect these expansions in uh, WGS data. Uh, our simulation studies show that all the methods perform uh, well across the known loci that we simulated, um, with uh, some caveats around the use of uh, WES or WES-like data that I've, that I've mentioned. Uh, in particular, expansion hunter and tread pass are ideal uh, for expansions or known expansions that have known thresholds uh, as they estimate the STR size and can then be compared directly to these thresholds. Whereas extra and stretch uh, are particularly suitable for um, searching for novel expansions because they use outlier tests uh, rather than relying on this, this information. Finally, um, these methods are, are designed to use PCR-free WGS. Uh, however, we've seen that they work reasonably well in whole exome sequencing or in PCR-based WGS. And there are obviously some limitations, as I mentioned, but I think this is an important point because uh, it enables um, people to search legacy data sets, which uh, is, is very exciting. And as I've said, I think a few times by now, uh, I think that these methods are very exciting, but I would um, strongly encourage you to, well, one, to use these methods, but two, to use multiple or preferably all these methods when you're searching for repeat expansions. Uh, and then the best uh, or most, the strongest confidence comes when you get uh, a consensus call across, across all methods. Uh, and one final point is that despite um, these methods appearing to work very well, it's still critical uh, to validate any candidate repeat expansions identified using these methods using the, the gold standard tests. However, the benefit is that uh, using WGS data, we can search for all known repeat expansions uh, simultaneously, and then um, identify candidates to follow up with these gold standard tests, um, which has a lot of potential benefit 
uh, time and cost savings for patients. Finally, I'd just like to thank uh, Melanie Barlow and everyone in her lab at WEHI, in particular uh, Rick Tankard and Peter Dugorski, who contributed a lot to this work. And also thank our collaborators at Melbourne Uni, uh, MCRI and Adelaide, who've helped with this work as well. And finally, thank you for your time listening to this presentation. <laughs>